بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اجتبى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا صدق الله العظيم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم افسرنا حديث talking to sahaba ridwan الله عليه مجمعين that you are at a time that most of the people have good knowledge of deen illa al-fasiqu aw al-fasiqan except for one or two bad people in the community who don't acquire the knowledge of deen fa huma maqhuran dhalilan they are always humiliated they are cornered and they are known to be the bad people of the community Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to say, A time will come when most of the people in the community will have no knowledge of deen except for one or two people who would have some knowledge. Those people will be humiliated and they will be cornered. And those people will be cut off from the rest of the people. I'm sure hearing this hadith, a lot of feelings may be going through our minds and we can see a lot of things everyone wants to say a lot about this hadith. And there is a lot that can be said. But at this time, I just wanted to remind of the situation that was there at the time of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een that almost all the people, the whole community have a great and detailed knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the exception of one or two people. And those people, the term used for those people by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is al-fasiqu aw al-fasiqan. Fisq is one of the worst sin in Islam. Which means a person who's used to committing sins openly is called fasiq. So, bad people who's Evil is known to the community that these are bad people, this is why they don't acquire the knowledge of the deen. This was the situation. And this continued after Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Because it was a time that Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, all of them wanted their knowledge to be transferred to the next generation. They had a lot of worry about it and they all were busy teaching the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And accordingly, al Khulafa al-Rashidun and even the ones after them, they had fixed a salary for these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een so they won't have to keep on doing their businesses and get busy with their business so they can keep on teaching others the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you look at the time of Tabi'een, you would find people who are acquiring the knowledge of all the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. And they're going from one to another and they're traveling all around the world. They're after these Sahaba, looking for these Sahaba. And sometime you find in the history that a Tabi'i 
He knew all the hadith and he heard a hadith from someone on the authority of another sahabi. So he would travel from one country to another country. He may go from Medina to Egypt. He would go from Medina to Syria and from Syria to Medina and Makkah or from Medina to Yemen and from Yemen to Medina just to learn one that one hadith from the mouth of that sahabi so that he would get it directly from Sahabi. He already knows the hadith. He already got that hadith. It's not that he doesn't know the hadith, but he liked to be have a closer chain of narrator between him and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So instead of having two people in between, he would go and hear it directly from the Sahabi. So he would have only one person between him and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The zeal to learn the knowledge of his deen. That was their life. At that time, there were some scholars who came to be well known amongst the Tabi'een in different towns in Medina Munawwara. There were seven people who got to the peak of this knowledge. And accordingly, the title was given to them, Fuqaha al Medina al Sab'a. The seven Fuqaha of Medina Munawwara. Because fuqaha is the term that was used for those who have acquired all the sciences. And now they are to the level well, they, where they can do ishtihad and they can teach people the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by driving the Messiah from Quran and the Sunnah. So there were seven people in Medina Munawwara of that category. In the previous session we talked about one of those, Sa'id bin al-Musayyib rahimahullah, who was the leader of al-fuqaha al-sab'ah. Among these al-fuqaha al-sab'ah, there was one who had an opportunity of learning from some of the most knowledgeable people of his time. His father was one of an ashrat al-mubashshara, one of the ten people who got the glad tiding of Jannah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this life. His mother also was guaranteed the Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His aunt was guaranteed the Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His grandfather from his mother's side was the greatest person in the Ummah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his brother was known as the pigeon of the masjid. This is how much time he used to spend in the masjid so that people used to call him Hamamatul Masjid. He is the pigeon of the masjid. He's always in the masjid. That was Urwa bin Al-Zubayr radiyallahu anhu. The son of Al-Zubayr bin Al-Awwam radiyallahu anhu is one of, who was one of Al-Ashar al bashara And Zubayr bin Al-Awwam radiyallahu anhu got married to Asma radiyallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu who was known as Zatul Nitaqain. She is the one who prepared the meal for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time when he was leaving for hijrah to Medina Munawwara. And at that time, she tore up some of her dress and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, giving her the guarantee of the Jannah, told her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you for this dress in Jannah. We'll give you a better dress than this one in Jannah. Simply means a guarantee to Jannah that you are going to Jannah and getting a replacement to this dress that you offered for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Grandfather from mother's side, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. There is nothing to say more than about just mentioning his name is enough. And his brother was Abdullah bin al-Zubayr radiallahu anhu. One of the youngest Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. But he was known as Hamamat al-Masjid. He was known for his ibadah. And when he used to stand for salah, Sahaba are not exaggerating. It's the time of Sahaba. And then read about him that when he stands for salah, birds come and sit on his head thinking that it might be an idol. Urwa bin al-Zubayr radiallahu anhu got an opportunity to learn the deen, acquire this deen from his father. Then, learn the ibadah and deen both from his brother. And then at a time, when all the people of course are acquiring the sciences of, and the knowledge of all of these sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, 
he had an opportunity of acquiring the knowledge from his aunt Aisha radiallahu anha and spending all the time over there because after the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and especially after the time of Umar radiallahu anhu Urwa bin Zubair by the way was born at the end of the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu so the time when he's acquiring the knowledge is the time of the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu anhu and at that time the most knowledgeable person of the time was Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm al Mu'mineen, our mother. She is his aunt, so he spends all the time with her to acquire all the knowledge from her. Four years before she passed away, Urwa bin Zubair himself says, and he used to tell his children to encourage them to learn the deen. He used to tell them, you think that you are young now, but remember, one day you will become the leaders and you will be old. And it will be a shame to be the leaders of your communities and to be the children of Sahaba and you don't have the proper knowledge of deen. So he used to encourage them to learn the knowledge of deen and he used to tell them, four years before Aisha radiallahu anha passed away, I had acquired all of her knowledge and I had asked her every question about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I had got all the details about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's life in and outside of the home from Aisha radiallahu anha. There wasn't a single thing in the last four years of her life that she could teach me more than what I had already known from her. Subhanallah. So he already acquired the knowledge of the most knowledgeable person of that time. Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha. Normally when we learn the deen, a lot of times when we open the books and like to study the intention is, is a good hadith, I can tell people about it. Oh, it's a very beautiful hadith. Now I can give a khutbah about this. I can teach people. I can inform people that I know this. I have studied this. I have learned this. But this was not the purpose for those people to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were learning it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To attach themselves through this knowledge, to attach themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to practice the deen of Allah, put all of that into their practice. We find Urwa bin Zubayr radiallahu anhu, used to fast every day of his life, with the exception of the days that are forbidden to fast. Five days of a year. We are forbidden to fast in those five days, with the exception of his day, these five days, his son Hisham narrates that he used, he fasted throughout his life. When he passed away, he was 71 years old that, that year, that time. And even that day, the day he died, he was fasting. SubhanAllah. And imagine a person who starts the day with fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to keep him hungry once he has left, when he has left this world and gone back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the dream of Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was also fasting the day he was murdered. And he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his dream saying, Uthman, you are fasting today and you are going to break the fast with me. I'll be waiting for you to break the fast. Urwa bin Zubayr, same thing. He was fasting at the age of 71. They asked him, not to fast only for that day, he's too sick. He said, no, if I depart this world, I would like to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while I was fasting. His recitation of Qur'an was such that he used to recite one Qur'an every four days. But in a way that he would recite seven to eight juz in the daytime, then the same seven or eight juz would recite them in his Salat al-Tahajjud, so in other words, he's finishing one Qur'an every four days, one during the daytime, one during the nighttime. And the amazing thing about this is that he never missed, he never missed reciting Qur'an and performing Salat al-Tahajjud in his life since he had memorized the Qur'an with the exception of one day. With the exception of one day and one night when he missed Salat al-Tahajjud, he had never missed Salat al-Tahajjud in his life since he memorized Qur'an al-Kareem. What was that night? We'll talk about it in a minute, insha'Allah. 
it was the night, the night that he got married. If some of us may think that that night we may miss and we have the right to miss even Salat al-Fajr, that wasn't the night for, a night for him to miss Salat al-Tahajjid. Urwa bin al-Zubayr radiyallahu anhu was known for four things in his life. And subhanallah, a person who's, who has these four things in him doesn't need a fifth one. It's enough to know that this person have acquired what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the deen that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have left for the ummah. He was known for his ilm al-hadith, his knowledge of hadith, and his knowledge of fiqh. And of course, accordingly he was known as one of al-fuqaha al-sab'a of Medina Munawwara, the same al-fuqaha of Medina Munawwara, while the sahaba are still alive. The third thing he was known for, his ibadah. And in those days when everyone is busy in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for a person to be known for his ibadah wasn't that easy. And the fourth thing he was known for, generosity. He had a garden. One of the best gardens in Medina Munawwara with the highest fence around it. And that high fence normally indicates that the person doesn't want anyone to touch the fruit or touch anything in his garden. And this was the situation with him. He would not allow anyone to touch it. Until at the end of the year when the fruit is ready, he used to, he was not satisfied by just opening the doors he would ask the workers at the garden to even break a larger amount of that fence so people can get in from one side, come out of the other side, and eat as much as they want, take whatever they like from that garden. And that was every year. What is garden? The best business of that day. And the best business a person can establish in Medina Munawwara. Once is ready to make the money out of it, and to get the outcome of it, worked so hard on it for the whole year, now he will open the walls of the garden, not just the doors of the garden. That whoever wants to take whatever you like and as much as you want. No restrictions and no questions will be asked. Why are we learning this? This is for us to know. Who are our ancestors? Who do we follow? And who should we follow? And who should we be proud of? We are proud of to be the followers of those great people. And insha'Allah we will be the true followers of those. Through our actions we need to prove that we are the children of those people. We are the followers of those people. Those are our ancestors. This dunya, the world, the people around us in the world have no right to look down at us if we prove ourselves to be the right followers of those people. Subhanallah, those people gave us the honor that up to this day we are proud to talk about them. But by not following their steps, the world is looking down upon us. Urwa bin al-Zubayr radiallahu anhu, because of all the respect that he had, the king, the khalifa, the ruler of the time, Walid bin Abdul Malik, had a lot of respect for him, and once he invited him to Baghdad, he took his oldest son with him, he had four sons, Walid used to live over there in Baghdad in those days. The king, to get his barakah and to get his dua, he was showing him all around, took him all around the castle, showing him what he has. And finally, when they came back and sat there, his son was very impressed by seeing all of those horses. So he went back to be with those horses and spent little time around the horses. And subhanAllah, it so happened, that one of the horses kicked him, as he fell down, the other horses walked over him, and he passed away right then and there. Khalifa felt very bad that I invited him to make him happy, to give him some gift, and to get his dua, his barakah, and here something opposite have happened, and here he lost, he had a big loss over here. Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries all the people. And when the trial comes, it comes according to the iman of the people. 
very same time when his son, he's getting the message of his son dying, he had some pain in his, in his foot. So they showed the doctors and the doctors prescribed that this person, that he had some type of disease where we have to cut his leg. So of course he said, if you have to do it, go ahead, do it. In order to cut his leg, they had to give him some anesthesia. And of course, for that, he would be missing some of the fara'id because he will be unconscious. So he will miss some of the fara'id. When they asked him to take some of that, he said, no. I would never do that. I would never miss a fard salah in my life. Go ahead and cut it. I would start reciting the tasbih. I would be doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you see me getting busy in the remembrance of Allah, once you see me getting busy, my tongue is busy in subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, go ahead and do whatever you like to do. So they had, had some people around in case that he would move to hold him. He asked those people not to touch him. And they started cutting his leg. And he's busy in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cut his leg. After that they said to him, now a situation is coming that may be more painful than cutting your leg, and that is to stop the blood. They didn't have this method of sewing it back. They used to put that place, whatever place of the body that would cut, they used to put it in a boiling oil. So they said, we will have to put your leg in the boiling oil now. So now you better take this. He said, no, I won't take it. Go ahead and do whatever you like to do. And they put his leg in that boiling oil, and the doctors and everyone that was around was surprised to see that the only thing they heard from him is Allah, Allah. That remembrance of Allah was so sweet that while he's doing, he's in the remembrance of Allah, he's in the remembrance of Allah, he's not feeling anything around him. That love for Allah, that attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the only night when he missed Salat al-Tahajjid in his life. That was the night when he missed Salat al-Tahajjid. Walid bin Abdul Malik. Now he's feeling bad about it. He wanted to say some good words to him. Wanted to console him for the loss of his son and of, of his leg. I didn't invite you with this intention. But subhanallah, when you came here, you lost both of these things and now you will be going back, going back to your home. He was thinking how can he, what he can do for him. During that period, while Urwa bin Zubair in healing process, a blind person came and approached Walid bin Abdul Malik to get something from him, some gift. So he asked him, how did you lose your eyesight? That blind person said, I was the wealthiest person in my community. The wealthiest person in my community. We had a flood that took everything. I lost all of my wealth, all of my family members, with the exception of one son, and it was, that was an infant, and a camel. He said, after losing all of that, I thought, I would go and find another place for myself to live. I took my son, and my camel, and we were going, on the way I stopped somewhere, on one of the hills and one of the mountains, my camel ran away from me. I ran after the camel, by the time I was about to get to the camel, I heard my son crying. I looked back. My son's head was in the mouth of a wolf. By the time I'd go back, he had killed my son. I went back and got my camel to get my camel. Just the time I was getting to the camel, he kicked me and I lost my eyesight. He said to him, now you go. And tell this to Urwa bin Zubayr, he may feel good about his situation, that even with all the loss, is still nothing closer to what you have lost. When that person went to Urwa bin Zubayr, he narrated the whole thing to him. He said, I knew this. And he said, since I have lost these things, I'm not busy in complaining. I'm busy, my tongue is busy thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Ya Allah, you, got, you gave me four sins, you took only one, and still you left the other three for me. And Ya Allah, you gave me two hands and two feet, and you took only one out of four. Ya Allah, you gave me more than what you took. I'm grateful to you, Ya Allah, for giving me. And you give always, you give more than what you take. Subhanallah. This is how they realized what they are receiving from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
not complaining that, Ya Allah, I spend my life for your deen. I'm doing all of this for you and still I'm losing. Why other people are having and I'm losing? Nothing like this, subhanAllah. These people, this, is their, this was their sabr and this was their shukr. Urwa bin Zubayr radiallahu anhu. When he went back to Medina Munawwara, people started visiting him. Someone was weeping. That Urwa, we feel so bad that you lost your son and you lost your leg. He said, ah, but I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he took the things that I wasn't using too much. At least he gave me, he left this knowledge that I have acquired on my tongue so I can practice this knowledge and I can teach others through this tongue, I can teach others the knowledge of deen. This is what I have devoted my life for. I'm thankful to Allah that he left me with these things through which I can offer my service to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are our people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to learn our lessons from these great people. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us also one of these great people. His rahmah is great. He can even accept people like us. He can accept people like me. And he can just, if he would accept us, and if he would just allow us to be one of his chosen people, that's it, we got everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us the way He accepted those great people of the Ummah. And may Allah bless us with the knowledge and the practice of this deen and with His pleasure the way He blessed those great people. <laughs>